script, scripture reading will be from the book of Matthew, so if you would open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And after they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that had, they, they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Thank you, Phil. I love this time of year. It's just always great, isn't it? Families get together and we're able to see all kinds of good things happen. You even think about doing something good, don't you? Well, okay, try to think about doing something good. Uh, other people are thinking about doing things good for you, so maybe you ought to be thinking about doing some good things for them as well. It's always a good thing to be able to realize what God's doing among us, and we're going to have an opportunity tonight to do that. Uh, you'll remember that uh, we ask you to go and purchase a present. We have some families from Lowell Elementary School who are in not very good shape. And so we have adopted those families. We ask you to go purchase things for them. And so we are going to go deliver those things tonight. And if you want to be in that process and be part of that, be here at 5 o'clock and you will be able to go and uh, actually be part of the giving of the gifts and just tell people something that's good. So this is a message that's good. We want to give you this. We want to have God bless you. We want to pray for you. And it's just a, an amazing time. And so hopefully you'll be part of that. It's, it's just always amazing to watch all of that and the final piece especially. And I know Renda and Joanne will be so glad to get all those presents out of their office. It is stuffed to the gills in there. <laughs> so, what an exciting time. Christmas time, we've been talking about God with us, and that's really what this is all about. But I also want you to know this is not just Christmas time. This is in the Bible, okay? Um, it's right there. It's not that we celebrate it because... The world celebrates Christmas, but this is part of the Bible. And so we usually take this time to do this one specific part of the Bible. And, you know, I don't know that I've preached on this many other, maybe once on a different time. So I'm glad you're here today. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about what has happened. When you think about the way in which Jesus was born, I want to start in Matthew, the passage that Phil has read for us today. And then draw some lessons out of this. He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And the passage that, that Matthew gives us is 
a little bit after the time Jesus is born. Uh, Luke starts at the beginning. Matthew starts probably a year after, a year and a half after. And so he had already been born in Bethlehem. And then what you see is there is a star that shows up in the east and uh, some wise men, magi, see the star. And they decide to travel and to worship this new king that has been born. And as they travel to see this new king that has been born, they follow a star. I don't know if you've ever tried to follow a star. Those are very difficult to tell where that star is pointing, but somehow they were able to tell exactly where that star was pointing, and it means that there's a new king. They, they know it's been a baby. They, they know all of that, and so they're coming to be able to worship. He's not their king. They're from far away. But they recognize this is important. This is a world event. And so they want to come and they want to be able to worship this king. Because they respond as if, well, this is God with us. This is an important king. And so they're going to come and offer these gifts. When they do try to come, though, they lose the star for a while. And they end up going to Herod to ask about where the new king has been born. Herod is not especially excited about all of this. Uh, he didn't know that there was a new king to be born. He doesn't want a new king to be born. He is very threatened by this, that, you know, how could there be a new king born? And, but it's, it's going to be a baby. I mean, it's going to be a while before this would be any threat. But Herod's still threatened anyway. And so it says Herod was troubled and all of Jerusalem. That, that's a lot of people. I think it's mainly Herod that's troubled because he didn't know anything about a new king. And so he has to call for the chief priests and the scribes who are aware of the prophecy that, yes, there is going to be a new king, a child born in Bethlehem. Which is just to say that no matter what the news is, we can all have a different take on it. We can all respond to it very, very differently, just dependent on how you take it. And so any good message of God that is there, people can choose to see that as a terrible, awful thing. Any message that, that, that is good, that is seen as, well, this is wonderful. Well, we can always find people who will find a way to, to see it the wrong way. Christmas might be like that. Some people see, well, okay, Santa's coming and he's going to bring lots of presents and they will be under the tree. Or there's a guy in a red suit who's going to break into your house tonight and eat all your cookies. I mean, it just all depends on the way you look at it, right? So either one, I mean, we have to understand what's going on here and that some people are just going to see anything that's good as not being good. Herod summons the wise men and says, I want to know more about this king. And so you go and search for him. And when you find him, come back and tell me, because I want to worship him too. And what I want you to realize is that worship seems to be at the center of all of this. The wise men, the magi come, but they come in order to worship. Because that's what you would do with a new king. That's where you would be with a new king. That's what you want to do with a new king. And so they are planning on worship. Herod kind of buys into this as well. says, well, I want to worship too. But you know that he doesn't. You know that he's planning other things for the child. As they leave Herod, the star reappears and leads them directly to the place where they're supposed to be. Why did they lose the star? I know, I just have weird questions. Because what it means is now Herod knows there's a new king to be born. And Herod knows this king is going to be a threat. And Herod also knows that because this king is going to be a threat, he's going to try to do something about it. And from here, the babies who are two years old and under are going to be killed. Such a such violence that is done against God. And all they had to do is don't tell Herod. 
but God removes the star and says, go ask the king. And when they do, it sets up the whole process whereby Jesus now escapes to Egypt and yeah, there's some things I'm not sure I understand, but that's one of those amazing things that you see as God calls his son out of Egypt. And there's lots of ties in the Old Testament to that. But they come toward the house, and you will notice from verse 11, and going into the house, they're no longer in a manger, they're no longer in a stable, they're no longer in a barn, they're not there anymore. They went into the house, and so the picture might look more like this. Jesus is a year old. He's already walking. He's already saying some words by the time that they get there. They do understand the timing and that the star appeared on the day he was born. And that's how they know exactly the timing for when the birth was. But this is one of those things that as you try and look for a picture of what it looked like, every single picture has wise men in a manger. There were no wise men at the manger. There were no wise men at the stable. There were no wise men there in the place where Jesus was born. This is several years later. It's taken this trip a long time. And so I want you to be aware that there are some things that, that get a little bit distorted in the story that we tell. It probably was not December 25th. And there is no little drummer boy, just to <laughs> clue you in. Um, it, so there are some things that are misrepresented. I want you to understand what the Bible has to say about this because we shouldn't let anyone take this story away from us. This is ours. This is the birth of our Savior. This is important. As they come into the house, it says they fell down and worshiped him. I don't know if you've thought about that. They didn't trip. They were not clumsy. That's not what he's trying to describe. I don't know if we've ever fallen down to worship, but it comes that this is so important that it, they, they bow so quickly, they kneel so quickly that it's like falling down. And that's the way it's described a lot of times. They fell down and worshiped. It's, it's this idea of bowing down before someone, of, of suddenly saying you feel such awe in being in their presence. They knew what they were looking for. They knew why they had come. They knew how old Jesus was, and yet still they are filled with awe and wonder and amazement. It's the wow. There he is. It's like that when you saw your child, right? Even more so when you saw your grandchildren, right? <laughs> Because how amazing that is. And you'd seen babies before, but wow, this one's better than all of them. And then they grow up. <laughs> but they've come to worship. Why? It's not required. God didn't say, I want everyone to show up at Jesus' house and bring gifts and worship, not at all. Because it makes favor with God, because it's significant, because it's important. It's one of the most significant things that they're going to do. And they bring important gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, gifts that are fitting for a king. And it's probably those gifts that fund the trip to Egypt and so you can see God provides in what's going to be needed next. Is a baby important? Well, if it's yours, it is, right? And that's what's important for us to realize. Does a baby change your life? Just a bit. Changes your schedule, changes what you eat, where you eat, how you eat, changes the laundry a lot because there's a lot more of it changes where you go, changes the time when you can go, because you can't just go anytime. You've got to work around nap time. You've got all these other things that we have to do that we, and yeah, baby becomes the focus of our world. Why not Jesus? Can we see the adult that he will become? 
Can you see the adult that your child would become? Could you see it when they first started? Can you see it now? Did it work? Did you help them get there? Did you train them? Did you try and encourage them to go in a certain direction? Did you send them to school? Did you have school in your house? Was school even important? Or did you just say, well, we'll let him grow up and see if he needs math, right? There's always time to teach him that later. It's amazing how many people say that about religion. And that, you know, well, all the Bible training he needs, well, we'll just let him grow up and decide if he wants to be. Well, it's maybe the most important thing that is needed. When you start thinking about it, when did some of the people that we read about in the Bible that were great spiritual leaders begin? Well, Moses was at his birth. John the Baptist at his birth. Jesus at his birth. Anybody who goes into a professional sport starts practicing by the time they're three or four. I mean, if you made it to 10 and... You have never picked up a golf club. Well, forget it. You're not going to be on tour. You've got to start early. Well, why wouldn't we start early training children for what they're going to need? And if the focus of the wise men is worship, why wouldn't our children need Bible class? And we would start Christian training just as early as possible. That's when we start. If our response is worship, wouldn't that echo into your family as what you would do with them? Well, that's one side of it. Let's go back to the beginning and look at what happened when the day when Jesus was born. And I obviously got too carried away and missed a few slides. <laughs> um, no, wait a second. In Luke 2 and verse 7. It says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over the flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on, per on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And so the first group we might have seen as people who were somewhat religious, as people who came and who, who thought about worship. And so they came in order to worship. The shepherds are not that way at all. The shepherds are at work. They're out in the field. They're not in the barn. The animals are not in the barn. The pictures you see of Jesus surrounded by animals, not really valid. Animals are in the field with shepherds. And so you see them out away. And shepherds are there and not much is happening out in the field. It's kind of quiet until the angel of the Lord appears. And says, don't be afraid. I don't know why they always start with that. They Maybe because everyone is always afraid whenever they start and... There's good news, and it's a great joy, and it's for all people. It's not just king of the Jews. This is for all people. There's going to be a Savior born who's Christ the Lord. And so the angel comes, and you're able to see what an incredible thing it is. And the multitude of angels then come, and they're all praising God. Glory to God in the highest on earth. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. What an amazing thing that you're able to see this. I, I just can't really imagine it, and I know there's no picture that can, can draw it for you. How many angels are there anyway? I mean, five, 50 million. 
and the whole sky lights up because I think they all wanted to come. They seem like they're so excited. They just want to be there and want to be part of this. And they got to tell somebody. And when something this big and this exciting comes, well, they begin to praise God. And then they say, this is a sign. You're going to find a baby who's been born in a manger. And really, that's what they're excited about? Yeah, that's what they're excited about. Baby has been born and you're going to find him in a, in a feeding trough. What? I had one lady who objected greatly when we talked about this because I said that Jesus was born and laid in a feeding trough. And she's, oh, no, it wasn't. It was a manger. <laughs> so don't call me this afternoon. They are the same thing. That's what the manger was. It's a place where the animals came and the animals ate. And it's a place where you put the straw or the hay. And it wasn't there for baby birthing. It was there for animals. And so you might have a little ox slobber on the side of the thing. And the sheep and the cows and everybody would come in. And that's where it was. And I think it's significant because it says Jesus is born into one of the dirtiest places on earth. He is us. And all of the, the dirt and all of the things where you could put him, that's where he begins. At the very beginning. Hay is clean, right? Yeah. It's been growing in the field, and I'm sure they cleaned it all up and washed it and cleaned that manger out and scrubbed and sanitized. And no. Well, it's cleaner than the mud on the ground, but it's where Jesus is. And what makes it significant is not the beauty of the baby but the realization of what is happening. And the multitude of angels is so amazed at all of this. Why did they tell him what they would find? Why, why did angels say that? You're going to see a sign, and the sign's going to be a baby, and the baby's going to be in a manger. Okay, well, they know where the sheep are kept, and so they would go to that same place. And what he's essentially saying is, here's something I want you to go experience. I mean, they've already seen the angels. They've already seen the heavenly host. They've seen this huge number of angels who have come, who are giving praise to God. And, and then the angels say, and guess what? That's not the end. You're going to see this. You're going to get to go see the baby. And they're like a baby in a manger. Okay, but isn't heavenly hosts more exciting? I mean, how huge is that when the whole sky lights up and the angels are all giving praise to God? And no, I want you to go see. And so in verse 15, it says, When the angels had went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. It's a decision they have to make. They decide, well, maybe we ought to go look. Sounds like some of the rest of us, doesn't it? And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known to them the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who had heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And so the shepherds decide to go look. I guess the angels told them to go look. You're going to see a sign. You're going to see something great. And there's no response from shepherds. It's like, okay. And so, well, I guess we should go look. And so they go over and they go look and... Sure enough, there he is, right? Baby with mom. There's no light coming off of the baby. There's no halos around them. And they start telling about the shepherd. 
or they, the shepherds start telling about the angels that came about how heaven had opened up and all of the praise that they had just seen. And they said, this is about this one child. And I can imagine that Mary said, yeah, I've seen an angel too. Right when I got pregnant that the angel said this was going to happen. And Joseph says, and I've seen an angel too. He's the one that said, his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. And I was supposed to call his name Jesus. And so as they begin to tell about these stories, they realize this story is so much bigger than just there's a little baby sitting here. This is, this is about all of history coming together. And this is about a time when it's just an incredible thing that this baby has been born because this is God. How do you do that? How do you put him in such a tiny place? And shepherds had decided to go and they find Mary and Joseph and they do have a story to tell. They do have something to be able to share. And Mary keeps all of these things in her heart. I'm sure she had heard the name, God with us, Emmanuel. And she knows it's going to be named Jesus because Joseph had said. And all these things are experiencing. And the one phrase I want you to notice for all of this, that, that's why we've been saying all of this. And the shepherds returned praising God for all that they had seen and heard. The shepherds had not been praising until then. Why not? What is it that made them praise? It's when they saw Jesus. And it's amazing to realize that because we don't assume shepherds are accustomed to worship. They're out in the field all the time. They may not even get the chance to go to synagogue but they're glorifying God for what we saw and what we heard because angels told us. And what an incredible thing it is to realize that that's what makes the difference. Worship starts with experience. I mean, some people know it and they understand the significance already. And so wise men come and, and it's significant that they have made this huge journey, this travel that's taken over a year to be able to get there so that they could experience one moment, one hour that says we got to sit with a baby who's going to be king of the world. It's the experience that brings out the worship, right? Right? It's not just the sight of the baby. It's not because it's a better than any other baby. In fact, we're told he didn't look all that good. But as you think about it, worship starts with experience. And you take people who aren't used to worshiping like shepherds in a field and angels, wow, well, that was, that was impressive. That was good. And there's no worship. But as well, we should go look. And it's after they leave the presence of Jesus, who is God with us, that there is praising God for everything they had seen and heard. The way you get to verse 20 is because they experienced God. And so the praise with God comes because they went, they saw, they heard, they tasted, they touched, they, they were there as part of it. And that's what it takes for us to be able to worship God. And so if you want a rich, satisfying, powerful, honoring, joyful worship to God, you need to experience God with you. And so worship comes from what we believe and from what we Experience, not just the fact that, okay, we saw it or something. Experience makes all the difference. It pulls it out of you. And that's why it's important for you to be here today. And I'm so thankful that you are today because what happens is when we are involved and focused and when we actually show up because God said, I'll be here today too. And so God was 
God with us, as his name indicated back then. And he said, I'm going to be with you always. And when you come together, God will be with you. And that's why we came today, isn't it? Isn't that what it's all about? When we are so overwhelmed with the things God is doing. And how do you do that? Well, you do that when you experience those things. I saw a story of a orchestra that was playing and one particular child in the orchestra. This is a picture of some of the people in the orchestra. It's much bigger than this. It's the Handel and Hayden Society. And the article goes, there's nothing quite like that moment at the end of a fantastic concert when the final note sounds and a long hush falls over the audience as the people savor the experience. But at a recent classical concert in Boston, one child just couldn't hold back his enthusiasm. The Handel and Hayden Society, one of America's oldest performing arts group, had just finished performing Mozart's Masonic funeral at Boston's Symphony Hall when a young child broke the silence with an exuberant, wow! <laughs> Thank you. And exactly what happened here happened there because it was paid off and it was so palpable and genuine that it won laughter and applause from the audience and it deeply touched the musicians. But they didn't know who it was. And so they searched and tried to find him. And they found the boy who had recently charmed the audience with the wow. His name is Ronan Martin. He's nine. He lives in Kensington, New Hampshire. That's what GB, G, WGBH News reports. He was attending the concert with his grandfather, Stephen, who told the news that he can count on one hand the number of times that Ronan Spontaneous ever came out with some expression of how he's feeling. Because Ronan is on the autism spectrum and Stephen Matin explained, adding that he was touched by the positive reaction. But there are those moments when it's just so overwhelming. And when he heard that orchestra, it was, wow. Do you get like that when you see Jesus? Do you have those God moments? I think shepherds were at Wow, that's where they were because that's what worship is. We eagerly seek God who is with you and your life and your worship are filled with wow. The experience drives the worship because you saw something, because you had to make some effort to go see it, but you went and you saw it and they came. And the baby experience drives the worship as he watches the baby with his parents. That they could experience the awe of God and what God is doing. And you don't have to transport yourself back there to that time because God is doing some amazing things around us. Just show up tonight for presence. It's what God is doing and we want to be involved in it and we want to see it because it's what makes worship work. And if you ever think worship is stale and it doesn't really go and I only, you know, I don't like it. Because maybe you haven't found the experience yet to be involved in something enough to, to realize that God is still working, God is still alive, still active, and you miss the wow. It might be a conversation. It might be somebody who got well. It might be a time in prayer, but God is still moving. And the next time a baby's born, do you, you wanna go rejoice with the mom? 
don't go in the middle of the night, okay? I mean, that's not a good time. I'm sure the shepherds thought about it and said, well, I got to go get my shoes on. I have to, you know, it's a long ways back into town. It's... But the answer to finding deeper worship is an encounter with God. That's the engine that drives worship. And without our encounter with God, our worship gets stale. But you get to start a conversation anytime you want to make disciples. Are the shepherds disciple makers? Nah, they're shepherds. But they have a story to tell. And they leave rejoicing. Are the wise men disciple makers? No. But they do have a story to tell. And people listen. And people follow. And that makes disciples. And somehow around this time of the year, you can't go anywhere without seeing plastic wise men. I mean, there's, there's stuff all over that talks about this story. I don't want you to experience the American holiday. I want you to experience the real God who was born on earth. Because we're not waiting for a miracle. We can start the conversation anytime we want. And there are things that we can do that make a difference that will change everything. So my invitation is not to ask that a baby be born this morning so that we can all say, wow. But I will ask for a new birth, maybe from you. Because if you don't have this new birth, maybe you don't understand what the wow is all about. And they had hundreds of people sitting at that same symphony who have sat there and listened to this fantastic music went, we're supposed to be quiet now. No, there's, there's one who, kid who gets it. And maybe sin in your life doesn't let you have the wow. And you need to get past it. And you need to have it forgiven. And so maybe baptism is the way that changes your view and changes your life because it is the beginning of a new birth and a request for a new life in God. And I hope today in worship there's a new experience with God. And I pray that as you look around, as you meet with your family, and that there are times when you're able to be there. And you look at the babies in your family, and maybe the babies that are bigger than you in your family, that you'll remember their birth and tell them about how amazing it was. Because everyone needs to know that story. When my kids were little, they would always ask Nancy, tell me the story about the man and the lady. It was their story. And we have a story about a Savior. Tell them that one too. Because that one is significant. And tell them about the wow that you feel that would draw you to worship God and to sing his praises. What a great thing that is. So today, if you don't have that, wow, let's fix that. And today, we definitely will want to be able to praise and worship God. Let's stand and sing.